the Egyptian revolution now is very difficult, <laughs> truly, because we're actually attempting to speak about something that's still happening, and we're still in the middle of it. The baby's not born yet, obviously, but we're still, we're going to uh, try our best, all of us, I think, if I may uh, speak for everybody. But uh, the angle, uh, in terms of the wonders of Tahrir that I chose to speak of, because of my background, I'm an architect, urban planner, is obviously there are millions of stories that would actually together would create the wonders of Tahrir and what has happened and what is happening. But this is one little angle. We'll, we'll end up with a story, a story that actually shook me and affected me and still affects me to today. But I'll start by prefacing my talk with uh, something that happened last year. I spoke uh, at the TEDx Cairo uh, event and I told everybody in the room, you young Egyptians are in a coma. You guys are absolutely out of it. And uh, I was not ready for a rude awakening on January 25th. It was amazing. I was shocked to realize, and I think what was happening, that coma was, in fact, they were dreaming up revolution in the making. So it's almost, I feel like I have to apologize to the young Egyptians that actually came up and uh, went out on the streets on January 25th. That said, I wanted to <clears throat> begin to describe the experience of being in Tahrir Square and in the early days of the revolution and how I saw it in the beginning from the perspective of an architect, obviously from this perspective of an Egyptian first, and as an architect. The, quickly, Tahrir became the epicenter of the revolution. The epicenter in the geographic sense, everybody was describing, everybody's converging on Tahrir Square. Things are happening all over Egypt, but everybody's going to Tahrir Square. So it became the epicenter, the center, the focal point of that revolution. And things were happening so fast that even definitions of the revolution, definitions of the square were constantly being up, uh, upgraded and changing by the hour, if we may say. Uh, what happened, if I, if I may frame it actually in a way that will uh, describe the geography of Tahrir, because it may actually be obvious to most of you, but to those who do not know Cairo, that Tahrir Square is a very weird uh, space, urban space. It's actually surrounded by a multitude of uh, unusual structures that on one side, if I may say, is the edge of colonial Cairo, completely, a wall of architectural uh, residential structures. On the other edge, actually, is a series of structures. Each one of them have a very interesting symbolic significance. Mugamma, which is the, 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 the headquarters of Egyptian bureaucratic tyranny. Next to it, <laughs> literally, next to it is the mosque that is unofficially supposed to be the state mosque. And then next to it is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Next to it, the Arab League denoting the notion Cairo, the center of the Arab world. Next to it is an old uh, edifice from the modern era of the, what used to be the Nile Hilton. Next to it is the headquarters of the NDP, National Democratic <laughs> Party, which uh, we all know where it is now. And then, <laughs> and then the Egyptian Museum. Egypt's treasures of an ancient civilization. All of them sitting side by side, creating another wall on the other side of high, very significant symbolic dimensions. Uh, when, when, the, uh, when the revolution in the early days, the 25th, 26th, 7th, 8th, the 28th was very decisive. Everybody knows on Friday, something happened on Friday night that the museum itself was in danger. Everybody was there, fire bombs, rubber bullets, uh, you name it. People simultaneously, something magical happened. I can't believe it until now. Something magical happened that a wall of a human chain of young Egyptians decided to hold hands, all of them together, to protect the museum with rubber bullets, fire bombs, everything flying around you, and they completely, completely ignored the danger, and they were protecting a building. For God's sake, a building. Naturally, you're supposed to run for cover. But that building, I think at this moment, the collective subconscious of ancient Egypt and all of Egypt came to the surface, and those the kids, 
the young Egyptians, everybody was constantly, were actually together doing something. I don't think they were aware of it. And we were there. Everybody was doing it simultaneously. There was no plan, obviously. Nobody was actually running the show from behind. And that moment, the, the museum was in complete danger because the building next to it was on fire. The NDP, the NDP was on fire. One spark from the NDP flying over to the museum would be the end of it. I know the museum from the side out. Actually, because I'm an architect, I work on the museum. I know every single door coming in and out. At this moment, personally, if I may be personal here, I was so <coughs> paranoid about what I knew exactly all the possibilities that could go wrong with the museum, more than you know, because of the nature of my job. So I ran into a bunch of uh, guys on the square, revolutionary uh, young Egyptians. I ran into my nephew, also in the middle of the milieu. That was like in the middle of the dark. It was 10, 10, 10 30 p.m. Fire in the NDP. The museum was completely surrounded and nobody to protect it, really protect it. So we ran up. There was a column of army officers and army tanks and army uh, personnel carriers lined up on the bridge. We ran up. Literally, literally, begging the officers. We went up to the uh, soldiers, asked them, where's your commander? They pointed at a very high-ranking uh, special forces, uh, Egyptian high-ranking officers with a star, two stars and, a, and an eagle, and uh, basically said such and such. I cannot mention his name, but go to him. So we went to him, and we said, please, Secure the Egyptian Museum. That moment, that officer looked at us straight in the eye. I think those are some of those moments in our lives that you'll never forget. This was a moment that it was probably half, less than a second. It was like a turn. He looked, and there was some silence, and he looked at me. He was still addressing the older in the crowd, I think. But anyway, he looked at me straight, and he said, I'm here to secure the museum. I can't. I cannot enter the square. So I said, why not? He said, two of my personnel carriers are burned. I lost one young officer. Two soldiers are missing. I cannot enter the square. And then he paused again. <clears throat> And he said to us, would you secure our entrance? This is a big army officer. Would you secure? Would you promise? Would you actually help us? Would you, could we enter under your protection? This is like four, five people he just met, young Egyptians on the bridge. And he said, absolutely. So we turned around, said, what do you need? Immediately, plan of action was being put. What do you need? He said, I need four carriers four tanks, but we'll enter with the carriers first, and then we will see if we can bring more people or more tanks to secure the museum. So we took that path. It's about 500 meters from the top of the bridge going opposite traffic. There was no traffic, obviously, at this moment. We went down. He told us, you guys have to lead the way. I cannot lead the way. So we had one of the guys had a car, a, a civilian car, a, a Toyota or something, and I was with him in the front. We came, the four trucks with the high-ranking officer sitting. He did not ha his high was actually communicating with us, not with anybody else. He was actually literally following our command, going down the way on the bridge, all the way. And when you enter down from the top, you leave the, the bridge and you enter into absolute chaos. Everybody knows to penetrate up the Menemirad Square to the other side, this is the most, one of the most complicated and most dangerous spots during the revolution, early days. So we have to cut through, go across, and then when you pass the barricades, then you have thousands of Egyptians, <coughs> revolutionaries. We did not call them revolutionaries then. This is in hindsight, obviously, because we're still in the making, but now I know they were. We know they were. Literally, you have to cut through it. So I left the car and walked in front of the car, the civilian car, and the trucks behind us, and we cut through the masses, hoping against hope that they would actually believe us. We could, we could be 
أمن دولة. We could be the enemy. We could be anything coming to destroy whatever. So I have no idea why they believed us. We went through the army behind us. It took us about an hour and a half to go through the, 100, the 500 meters. And then we went down all the way. Uh, the, uh, the beginning of the cutting through where the Egyptians, I've unfortunately, I, unfortunately, I do not have pictures of that moment, that moment when they were holding hands to protect the museum. I know it, it's, it's engraved in my brain, but that ritual remained throughout the revolution. Even though the army already took control, but they remained holding hands to completely protect it. What I want to say here, most important, is what was going on here? This was the epicenter of the revolution, the actual uh, place where the real protesting and fighting was taking place. But something else was happening. I think at this moment, the collective subconscious of Egyptians actually rose to the surface, trying to protect their civilization. They're aware of it. If you would have asked me last year, I would have said everybody should run for cover. Something magical happened for the thousands and thousands of kids that actually took it upon themselves to protect their civilization. They were aware. It's not a building. They were aware of the fact they are protecting something so precious with treasures, major treasures. But what I want to say is something more complicated, I think, is the very moment that they were protecting the museum, something else was happening in the square, a different kind of transformation that was happening within the square. The moment that everybody was actually trying to do this, with all honesty, they just wanted to embrace the soldiers. Army soldiers, police soldiers, all they wanted to do to embrace them, to tell them we're doing this for you. This was another mechanism. A different kind of transformation was taking place. Tahrir, in a very, this urban chaos of space, was turning from what we know it to this. Everybody knows what happened on Wednesday after. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm actually passing the first Friday. This is Wednesday. We know what happened. We know what happened. This was amazing, but this is exactly what was on everybody. Whenever, actually, something amazing happened. Whenever the, 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 the Egyptians caught the, the, the horses, the gentleness of treating the horses that they caught was amazing. They held them up, tied them up, got them food, barsim, clover for the horses. And literally, this is what they were thinking about, doing this, this. People, strangers, this old lady, or this lady, this guy is not an army for, uh, uh, soldier. He's an actually security forces. This is exactly what was happening. The transformation that took place in the middle of the square, creating the Republic of Tahrir, as we call it, was incredible, incredible. That paralleling, putting that parallel with the awareness and this, the collective subconscious of protecting the museum, and, and what we got in return was that, literally. I mean, the, 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 the superimposition of the difference between the behavior of the revolution and the opposite, whoever they are, wh wherever they are now, is mind-boggling, mind-boggling, the moment. The, the, what, I, what I'm trying to say, something fantastic, the epicenter of the revolution, I think, gave way to something else, because the true treasures were not the treasures inside the Egyptian Museum. The true treasures, honestly, today, now, are those young Egyptians that actually collectively behaved in the most amazing way that the whole world is still wondering in amazement about. It. The, that's why I call it the epicenter. It was not the epicenter of revolution in the sense of hundreds of thousands and millions gathering in that square. It was actually the epicenter of a civilization literally, literally looking for itself, wanting its own soul back, reclaiming its own soul, wanting back what has been lost for whatever number of years. This is the magic of that moment. The magic, I'm using 
the museum story in a way just to, to just create a hint of what was going on. Because I'm sure there are hundreds of stories that if you put them together in a mosaic would create the true story of this honorable, most amazing revolution. Something else I think also was, uh, was happening is it, at, at that moment in front of the museum, Friday the 28th, honestly, it dawned on me that moment, this is not an uprising. This is not protesting. This is a revolution in the making, absolutely. Not because of the numbers. Some people would actually say, uh, January 25th, such and such number, the numbers increased, the number kept increasing. It's the transformation that took place in front of my eyes and millions in the subconscious of those young Egyptians. By the time, actually, we're young and old and everybody actually was an absolute indication this is something major, something major. And we know now this revolution is not just about getting rid of the regime. It's actually reinventing, rediscovering the soul of Egypt. That's why I call it. It is the epicenter of a civilization trying or attempting to fighting for her soul. Thank you very much.